Hello, and this will be probably the last of the Why Do Ghosts Wear Clothes series. Um, pretty sure it is the last of that series because it's all that I've, I've this is all based on things I've written down. And uh, I wanted to cover all of it. You know, I haven't gotten a lot of views on this and it hasn't been really exceedingly popular, but that's all right. It's free. It's free. Watch it or don't. You know, it's it's fine. I want to get it done just the same. So I'm going to be reading uh, the last bit of information that I wrote down on the topic. Why do ghosts wear clothes? Where do they get them? And this has to do with uh, time and energy and matter in the spirit world. Try to explain some of the phenomena that uh, we call paranormal. Uh, spirit world that we're part of, we're like amphibians, we're still in the pond of life and moving you know, out into the vaster spirit world. I believe we're here in this world, but we're also spirits of an immortal world. So I consider us like amphibians here. So it is relevant, it is part of our existence for sure, and uh, shouldn't dwell on it too much, which was the inspiration, my 15 minute timer, by the way. It was the inspiration, okay guys, you gotta move for writing this down a few years ago was I saw a lot of paranormal uh, people, ghost hunters uh, was big and a lot of people I knew or some people I knew personally were into the paranormal uh, ghost hunts and seances and these were people that call themselves Christians and I'm not saying they weren't Christians but I do believe what they were doing wasn't Christian like, I don't believe God wants us going on ghost hunts, uh, doing seances. I have had a lifetime of hauntings. I've had a lifetime full of blessed things encountered with God's angels, interventions from God, God talking to me, um, miraculous things, the power of prayer, things I've, I've given accounting of in the first stories of this. And then I've had a lot of unsought after, mostly unwanted, uh, paranormal encounters of all sorts. And uh, so, and I've been a Christian my whole life, and I'm still keeping the faith. And I spent years doing what my mother and a few other people told me to do, was to completely ignore the paranormal. Don't give it any energy, and it would stop. Well, that didn't happen. I did ignore it completely when things happened. I just ignored it. I said some prayers, and but you know what? It didn't, didn't, in fact, things seemed to pick up. So there was no turning it off or on. And that's just how it is. It's how I'm wired. Things are still going on presently. My last video, I thought I encountered a few paranormal things. Um, I think I've kind of debunked those and I want to say that because I will usually try to find a natural explanation for things. Um, like the last video, I thought some spiritual activity was going on in the video. And now I'm not so sure. I don't think that's what was happening. So, you know, I don't go looking for these things. Now, the ghost stories that I've told, the paranormal stories I've told on this channel that have happened to me, uh, I cannot uh, debunk, as they say. Um, there's no debunking those. It, there's, you know, you you know you get a full body apparition or things like that, and things that go on here uh, I can't debunk. Um, I don't really like to talk about it. But uh, in the last video, the, some of the things I think I did debunk. But you know, I'm sitting here alone with candles, making a video at night in a house by myself in a house where I've had hauntings. And I get a little jumpy, honestly, I, I can get a little jumpy. I think it's understandable. 
So I'm going to move on. I think I said that I wanted to make these videos to reach out originally to people that seek out the paranormal, ghost hunters and people that are into that. Um, just to let them know that this stuff is real and what I know about it. A guy that never had to seek it out because it just comes to me. And uh, just to let you know that it's all real and what I've learned from it and what I believe God says about it and uh, why you should not be, as a Christian, going on ghost hunts and such. All right, I'm going to read this. Uh, this is the end of this whole why the ghosts wear clothes thing. We'll get through it. And I may not adhere to that 15 minute. Um, this has to do, it's kind of a continuation of my last video on time, energy, and matter. Well, actually, the last video was on um, the haunting of Eastern Airlines Flight 401. So the video before that one was on time, energy, and matter. Because when I wrote this, and still, I had some things going on that not just I experienced, but other people in the house with me, where it wasn't just a spirit activity. There seemed to be items, furniture, and things, and not to mention clothing from that spirit's past, phantom clothing, phantom furniture that you could hear getting thrown around or moved, and there was nothing there. Um, or the room, like at the ski manor, is being ransacked and nothing is disturbed. So it makes, and it, I'm going to read on to this, all right? So this is stuff I wrote down. These are my thoughts. There's eight pages. More thoughts on differences in time, matter, and energy. Time seems to have taken a totally different quality for these spirits that haunt, some of which are moving but mired in the mucky, shifting realm, realm where the pond water of their time of death overlaps spirit land. And furthermore, their pond often seems frozen in time. Like uh, Congress Street, uh, it seemed like the spirit there was interacting with a house full of furniture that wasn't there that I could see. It was there, or was it? You know, furniture getting tossed around. It wasn't there in an empty room, or what sounded like a china cabinet getting pushed over with force enough to shake the house, shattering glass and stuff like you could hear glass shattering, and there was no such thing in my house. It's all from another time. Odd. And stuff like that that I've encountered inspired these questions and observations. Here's an enigma. Their clothing and furniture, perhaps even their homes, all material things possessing no spirit or life force, but apparently all possessing some energy just the same. And I covered that. All matter has energy. This has energy. It is not bio biological or spiritual energy, but it has energy. You can't create or destroy energy. It just changes forms. That energy is somehow existent in both realms, like an endless tapestry, past or present, all rolled out. How can a ghost move through a closed door or other solid objects that still seem to be stopped by certain doors? I've seen them come through walls. I saw one not too long ago, drop straight down through the floor and disappear. I've seen one come through the ceiling here. Uh, I don't like talking about things that happen here. And then I've seen them where they can't seem to get through a door, like on Congress Street, where they wanted to get into my room, knocking on the doors, pacing up to the door, but they can't seem to go through it. It's just kind of after a while, now you spooked me, but it made me wonder. Does it matter if the same door or wall was present when that spirit was yet alive in what I will call real time, real time in our living time now? Real time, like on video games, is present time, unpaused 
and constantly moving forward, the ever perpetual now. An idea of now apparently takes on a different set of rules upon our deaths. Death, as some ghosts seem trapped in an environment of time, matter, and energy that was paused at the time of their death but can yet interact with people in the here and now real time. Such was the case to the ghost that gave me a message in Scheme Manor. And in the Memento Mori story encounter, and also the case of the ghost in Eastern Airlines 401 that I just told a few days ago. This leads me to believe the following speculation I don't know if there's speculation, do I believe it? This, this leads me to come to the following speculation, better said. One minute, let me wet my whistle. With tw Twinnings Irish breakfast tea. Yum. Some spirits are able to view the future portions of that tapestry, whereon the qualities and laws of time, matter, and energy that we exist in for the most part, prevent that, that we can't see that where we're at in the perpetual now. So it all comes down to differing sets of laws with time, matter, and energy. There is non-living energy, such as cowboy boots, the guy was wearing. I call him the big guy with boots, so did some of the other people, because it sounded like a very large man with hard-soled cowboy boots walking across our wooden floors, uh, such as cowboy boots on hardwood floors, and there is living energy as far as humans go. The Bible states that God breathed his own spirit into us, and that is where our energy comes from. And I'll read Genesis 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And God breathed into him the breath of life. When the time comes for each of us to fully enter into the spirit world, we will instinctively be able to exist in its environment and governing laws, just as a fish understands how to breathe and swim underwater the moment it hatches from an egg. Yet it should be acknowledged that life for humans is more difficult and complex than that of a fish. Our earthly entrance that each of us makes upon birth requires a good deal of committed assistance from others to survive and succeed. Let's give ourselves credit where it's due. Sweet and sour mortal life is difficult from the very start to its inevitable conclusion. There undoubtedly exist many frontiers yet unexplored by man. If the intrepid and curious pioneers that are few, oh, it's the intrepid and curious pioneers that are few, sorry. Sometimes our explore, exploration vessels and gear are simply an unfettered, inquisitive mind, and I submit a mind that humbly asks the Creator for knowledge, guidance, and protection. If we're exploring it, you know, our, the best vessel for exploration and pioneer work is your mind an unfettered vessel, an inquisitive mind that asks questions and thinks that all things could be possible. That's the best vessel and craft to use to explore the unknown. And I submit a mind that humbly asks the Creator for knowledge, guidance, and protection. I will go out on a high limb and speculate that to now the answers to questions raised 
in this study of why do ghosts wear clothes could unlock some significant powers we might inherently own that are either locked, dormant, or undeveloped. By locked, dormant, or undeveloped, I mean that perhaps we have a certain power and ability, but are prevented from using it for one of three reasons. Like when Jesus said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain to get up and go into the sea, and it will. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you this. He was trying to tell you, I really mean this as a fact. If you had the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So why can't we? I say it's either locked, dormant, or undeveloped, our ability to do that. For one of three reasons. First reason, A, the ability is locked, perhaps, because God knows it would hinder our spiritual development and purpose here in this life. Or it is locked because if we could use it, we would destroy everything and then ourselves. If we had the power to move mountains, like I said in a couple of videos ago, think about it. If everybody had the power to just move mountains and things, uh, it, it would turn ugly here. This is a fallen world we live in, and fallen people. God knows that. <clears throat> or it's locked because if we could use it, we would destroy everything and then ourselves. Either in intentionally or unintentionally. Like the grieving of three -year -old, a three-year-old with a loaded handgun. Oh, sorry. Like giving a three-year-old a loaded handgun with exploded nuclear bullets. Uh, it is actually, you give people the power to, people have the power to move mountains, to tell a mountain to go into the sea. Jesus said, truly I tell you, you could do this if you had the faith of a mustard seed. That's like giving a three-year-old a loaded handguns with bullets, nuclear bullets, you know? Okay, so that's maybe it's locked for our own good that we can't do these things in the here and now. Or, possibility two, we have that ability, but it's dormant. Because we are so caught up in the struggles and necessities of this life that such abilities that might have once been open when we were newborn arrivals to this life have been buried by worldly concerns. This is not a flaw as the world necessitates that we stay tuned into the world and engaged until we leave it. It's, it's not a flaw to, to worry about, you know, life is, that's life, you know. You, I wonder how I'm going to fix my car or I wonder, you know, if I've got a medical issue, if it's ever going to get better or, you know, or I wonder if I'll ever meet anybody, I'm lonely or I wonder if I'll lose 10 or 15, whatever, it's life. Not to mention, it's just, life engages us. So maybe it blocks it out. And like I noticed with the story of the fly, where I killed a fly when I was a kid by concentrating, going into a trance, I noticed that as a child, I did have a purer mind and was more capable of doing things like that. And then you get involved in the world, you know, all the things of the world that really can uh, take you away from that. So maybe our ability to do these things is dormant. This is just a possibility to be aware of. It's not a flaw because the world necessitates that we stay fully engaged until we leave it, engaged in the matters of the world doesn't make you a bad person. Or finally, number three, we have that power, but the ability is undeveloped because we haven't spiritually matured enough to first recognize and then subsequently wield such inherent abilities. Okay, I've gone over my 15 minutes. I'm going to continue on. Um... 
the ability, maybe it's undeveloped because we haven't spiritually matured enough to first recognize and then subsequently wield such inherent abilities. Much like an eagle born in captivity would need to be carefully shown what its abilities are and then trained to develop and use its natural abilities. Maybe some of these locks can be picked by mortal minds, while some locked abilities require a key God alone holds. Regardless, it's no harm in asking God to help us unlock these powers. Ask Him. Ask. There's no harm in it. Regardless, there's no harm in asking Him to help unlock these powers. If it comes from God as a gift, you can be assured of three things. One, God felt you were ready for it. Two, it's free. Three, it's good for you. If God gives you a gift, you are ready for it, it's free, and it's good for you. Uh, closing thoughts. Um, based on my own experiences, well, I believe and follow both the Catholic and Protestant views on ghosts. Both views on ghosts do not answer or explain everything on the subject. Far from it. And they can't, really. And they don't try. The Protestant definitely does. The Catholics do to some extent. For example, what about the loved ones such as my, uh, my parents, uh, such as my mom who... Uh, appeared to me uh, about a month ago uh, to let me know that uh, she was okay and in heaven and that uh, our separation is only for now. You know, I told that story. I don't think that was a dream at all, not at all. What about loved ones that return briefly following their deaths to tell you they're okay? And I've heard stories from people, I'll tell you. I knew this, uh, well, one of our viewers, uh, Lorraine, uh, shared a similar story about her father with me. And um, I won't tell that here because I don't know if she wants that shared. I knew this woman, Indian woman, um, American Indian. And she told me, she was very spiritual. She told me um, that after her father died, he, she took care of her father in her house till he died. And um, he kept showing up. And I'd say, well, what would he do? He'd just sit there and talk to her. What would he talk about? How the kid's doing, things he talked about every day, like nothing had changed. I believe her. I totally believe her. This woman was not a liar or somebody to make up things. She was a very spiritual person. Not a very complex person, but a very spiritual person and an honest person and a Christian person for that matter. Um, I, and she told me that he kept showing up and they would just talk and she was like, kind of blew her mind, you know, but she went along with it and he just would talk about the kids and stuff, the grandkids. And she said one day it all ended when she looked at him and said, Dad, you're not supposed to be here right in the middle of one of his conversations. To that, he looked at her, and then he vanished, and she never saw him again. You know, so sometimes they appear like that, and the church doesn't really answer stuff like that, and I'm pretty sure that wasn't anything demonic on, in these cases. This happens a great deal to people, and it supports the notion that love between people survives death, that love between people survives a passing. At the same time, other ghosts seem to be in places because they chose to be there and don't wish to leave. That's like the ghost of John Sills in the story Memento Mori, I think it's story number 30 or something, who still seemed to abide in a farmhouse he knew literally from his birth to his death. He was born there and died there in his 80s. Clearly, the nature of the spirit world is quite diverse and far more diverse than the earth and universe we know of. My cell phone.
And my dog in here moving around. He gets angsty when I'm talking to the camera. I gotta get my dog a snack to calm me down. I gotta pay him. Here's three Scooby Snacks. Go on, get them. I gotta do what I gotta do. I know he'll interrupt this video if I don't. At the same time, all right, I already told that. Yeah, at the same time, ghosts seem to be in places because they chose to be there and don't want to leave. Like that of John Sills in Memento More, story number 30, I believe it's 30, around there, who still seemed to abide in the farmhouse he literally knew from birth to death. Clearly, the nature of the spirit world is quite diverse and far more diverse than the earth and universe we know of can explain. It is also apparent that people are just not supposed to know all these things because in spite of countless well-documented hauntings, the answers remain elusive, like a fistful of soft ice cream. I don't know why I wrote that down. Fistful of soft ice cream. Uh, of all the millions of ghostly encounters that the living on earth have experienced, to include my own. None I know of involves the ghost telling those humans yet alive what the spirit world and death are all about. That's not entirely true. Um, I wrote this down a few years back. Uh, my mom told me about a month ago that it has to be this way for now. That's all she said to me. And she held my hands. She was wearing a white robe. It's in a story I made about a month ago. And uh, she said it has to be this way because I was grieving her death every day, praying to God to tell her I said hello. And I really was really missing her. She died over a year ago, COVID. And uh, I, she told me it has to be this way for now, which tells me that love endures. Love endures the grave. Uh, obviously it does Christ and all died for us and loves us um fact is there remains a place in place an impenetrable veil or mystery maintained between them and us and I believe it is a well guarded veil for a reason there's a reason that we don't understand all these things. That's not just fully opened up to us. A reason that is going to be revealed to each one of us when our time is to cross over, then we'll know, I'll know. When I'm not here anymore, when you're gone, when we cross over, we'll know. Right? Uh, in the meantime, it is best we get on with mastering the many situations and problems and challenges our short lives throw at us. I think thrown at us for a reason, also to be revealed in the Creator's good time and the Creator's plan for each of us. For those ghost hunters actively going out and ghost hunting who claim Christianity as their protection, I see these people ghost hunting and they're wearing a cross or even a crucifix, but they're going out looking for this stuff. I respectfully, I respectfully ask this question of such people. Respectfully, why place yourself in a situation for no good reason other than curiosity or thrill that you would need to call God and his angels for help? Why, why test God? Why, put, why test God? Go out and get yourself in some jam, ghost hunting in a graveyard or something, or a seance or a Ouija board, and now all of a sudden you've got some dark stuff messing with you, and it happens, and it's hard to get rid of. 
Um, and then you got to call on God and the church to help you out. You put yourself in that position. You open the doors. So go to God and the church anyway, but learn from it. How would you find it if you had a child getting into things you told them they shouldn't for their own good, and they did anyway, and were continually calling on you to help them out? You still love that child, right? I don't know. Put it in that perspective. Where does paranormal research cross the line into reckless thrill-seeking, profiteering, or the occult? Um, I see people ghost hunting in graveyards. I think it's just disrespectful, sacrilegious. And if I had loved ones buried in that graveyard, I would probably be upset and tell them to stop. You know, it's, it's, I don't think it's a good idea at all. I don't think it's at all in any way good. <clears throat> I myself, uh, well, honestly, I would tell them to define their purpose. Why are you ghost hunting? Why are you doing this? I myself, while never partaking in any ghost hunts, seances, or the like, admit a guarded but strong curiosity in the paranormal. This is partly due to all my experiences that have cemented my belief in life after death, and also in part due to my own knowledge of my own mortality. You know, I think we all have that. But my paranormal experiences and knowledge is tempered with those experiences and convictions I have with my Lord God, a God that wants our undivided love and attention. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion look, looking for someone to devour. That could be somebody playing with a Ouija board, doing ghost hunts in a, some morbid, you know, graveyard or something. It could be anywhere. Bottom line, as a Christian, the only spirit you need to seek is God through Jesus Christ, who is the door and the way into that fellowship, a fellowship. You don't just find a spirit with God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You enter into a relationship, a, a fellowship. And that is precisely what God wants his, his first, that is precisely what God wants as his first commandment. And the entire Bible clearly states, he desires your love and he desires your companionship and your love. We all enter the spirit world in our due time. So prepare yourself now that you will not be in a bad state, possibly purgatory, possibly worse, like hell, separation. As most of these spirits in the collection of encounters seem to be, my collection of encounters, a lot of them, there were some exceptions, seem to be some reason trapped in this world. I will pray for their release and that they move on from here out. I will pray for them through Jesus Christ that they move out into heaven and to the God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, into the light. They move into the light, the light of the Lord God, the Father, the Creator, the one who loves them, who made them. For in John 10, verse 9, it says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and will find pasture. Jesus said, John 10, 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters, who enter, sorry, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture, John 10, 9. And last but not least, I say, call on him and know that he claims complete victory for you, for me, all of us on the cross. He complained equally. He claims complete victory.
in tongue tied. All are under his authority. All are under his authority. All spirits, all humans, under his authority. In this regard, heed well his words and advice concerning matters of the Spirit. Matthew 10, verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill your soul. Rather, be afraid of the one, as in the devil, who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. At last, the study draws to an end, and I've deeply enjoyed putting it together, and I know I've gone out on a limb in speculation um, and things. Still haven't answered a few questions or addressed, but I wanted to say, I thought I addressed it, when it comes to um, time, matter, and energy, it seemed to me like when the man died, the ghost, some of the ghosts that haunted some of the places I lived in, it seemed like their surrounding, you know, if the man died in, let's say, 1972, and the Congress Street house, and I'm being haunted, and, you know, 30 years later or so, 30, it seemed like he was still surrounded by all the things in his house that were there at the moment of his death, they didn't just disappear, that he was still there in that time. And it must be very frustrating to be stuck in a place where there's no purpose anymore because the body's gone and the soul, your true identity and self moved on to heaven, but yet your earthly, whatever you wanna call it, spirit, is stuck and uh, all things are made by God all things so God understands this whatever it is um, always be questions but uh, I think that's it for these for now and I don't know if it's done any good or anything but I think um, when I said that for pioneers and explorers the best vessel for exploring and doing pioneer work is your, your brain your, right there. That's the best vessel um, for that. To have an inquisitive mind, one that is curious and one that is open to things that you didn't think were possible because whatever, we live in it, we're kind of limited here. Um, and also ask God for guidance. God said he gives wisdom freely to whoever asks for it. I don't know the verse, but it's in the Bible. Ask for it. He gives wisdom freely. He doesn't expect anything back. Wisdom on matters is something he enjoys to give. Ask God for wisdom on things. If you're trying to learn how to move mountains with your faith, ask God for wisdom and guidance on it. You know, go to the Creator and then, you know, apply your own thoughts and whatever you got to do. It's a worthy subject. It's a worthy subject. You know, I see people, uh, young people these days, um, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. But like where I work, all they talk about is video games. Sometimes I think they're talking about their lives because I'm too old to really kind of associate with their generation. And then I realize, God, they're talking about a game. I thought they were talking about real life. No, it's a game. It's all simulation. And, uh, I mean, there are definitely worse things to do than get hooked on video games. But, you know, whatever trips your trigger, I mean, it floats your boat. You know, have an inquisitive mind. Explore. Explore and ask questions. But ask God, the Creator, for wisdom and protection. Uh, as well, protection. And that's all. I don't know, after this, what comes after this? Um, I don't want to tell any more ghost stories at this point. I might tell some more. I've got things going on. I don't really just feel like talking about it in this house, in my life. Maybe someday I will. 
I want to tell, uh, I got one more, at least one more, on this topic of forgiveness. And I'm still ruminating over the question. And the question is, does forgiveness, does full forgiveness require an apology? I'm kicking that one around uh, prayerfully. And when it's ready to present as a question and discussion, I, God willing, will put it out. All right, uh, time to blow out the candles and wish you all a good night, good day, wherever you're at. Thank you, and I want to say I've really enjoyed each one of you, um, your comments and your thoughts and your experiences. So thank you. God bless each of you. And you too, puppy. All right, let's get something to eat.